Guild Wars, Sea of Sorrows. Chapter 7 Kobaya had sailed for nearly a year with the Indomitable, and he knew every rock formation and major island in the northern bay of the Sea of Sorrows, yet not one of them broke the horizon, even after six days of sail. No seagulls hovered beneath the low-hanging dark clouds, and the sea was littered with wreckage. Severed masts and shattered keels tossed on the waves, and fouled white sails clung to rolling waves like funeral cloths. Thick kelp floated in massive drifts, and even the roll and swell of the waves seemed labored. The sea itself was filthy with sand and churned grit, and, horribly, here and there Kobaya could see something floating that may have once been part of a house. We should have seen something by now, he muttered to Psychox as they leaned out over the Havoc's rail. You can spy the lighthouse at Lion's Gate a day before you see the port. But there'd been no lighthouse. No Lion's Gate. Most sickeningly, there'd been no sign that any other ship had survived the wave. As they followed in the wake of the catastrophe, even the bullying char were quiet and subdued. The havoc felt like a funeral. From the crow's nest came the sound of a signal whistle. Psychox perked up, his four ears shifting forward with interest. The scouts spotted land. Claw Island, maybe, Kobaya guessed. Or the harbor cliffs? We'll see for ourselves soon enough. Macha looked up from scribbling sketches of the astrolabe onto a dirty scrap of torn canvas. She handed the brass disc back to Kobia, stuffing her designs into a hidden pocket of her blue robe. I just hope the modifications we made to the rudder won't flummox the whole thing and run the ship aground. The three of them stood at the port railing with the others, watching as land slowly came into sight. Kobaya recognized it first, the harbor cliffs. His smile faded as soon as he saw the cliffs. Something was wrong. There was no sign of the city's lighthouse. No indication of the skyline of roofs, nor of the watchtowers, nor of the islands that should have ringed the city's harbor. The wave had washed them full away, covering everything in a blanket of deep water. The feeling on deck wasn't one of celebration or even tense battle readiness. Silently, the havoc sailed between the high cliffs that once stood guard over the city's harbor. They were half as tall now, mere circles of stone peering over the high line of the sea. Around them, the remains of waterlogged masts jutted up through the waves. Kobaya peered over the side of the havoc, staring down into the water. Silt and earth swirled around the wreckage of houses, shipyards, and even cobbled stoned roads. There was nothing left of the white towers that had ringed the central keep or of the lion statue that stood guard over the city walls. There was nothing left of the home he'd known, the city where he'd been raised. Everything was drowned, buried in the massive surge of water. No one had survived. So many dead. And why? Where had the wave come from? What magic had overturned the sea? Had the nature goddess Melandru struck out in wrath, or had some darker force cast a horrible spell? Stories claimed that the entire kingdom of Or had been destroyed by such a spell, cast by an ancient vizier. Kobaya remembered the land he'd seen beyond the great wave. Among those strange mountains and the wide black plain, he'd seen buildings. Tall ones, with spires like Malkor's fingers, but far more elaborate and delicate than those jutting stones. Could it have been Or itself, risen from below the ocean's depths, the fabled city of Ara? Was such a thing even possible? Was King Bade alive? Had the royal family escaped the devastation? Who ruled Krita? And where had they gone now that Lion's Arch was destroyed? Kobaya sank to his knees, clinging to the Havoc's railing. The ships. The city. Thousands of people. Gone. His thoughts briefly flickered to his mother. Even though he'd hated the woman, he wouldn't have wished this kind of death on her. On anyone. The vastness of the realization sank in with a rush. The city was gone. The indomitable was lost. Everyone he knew was dead. 
Macha put her arm around Kabaya's shoulders and tugged at him. Stand up, you idiot, she hissed with uncharacteristic gentleness. The Shar are watching. She helped him to his feet, letting Kabaya lean his elbow on her shoulder. Centurion Harrow stood at the forecastle rail, scowling out at the water-filled basin that had once been a city. May your filthy gods take you all, he snarled under his breath. Even the shores wasted, silt-packed, slippery, and shifting. There's no docks, not even a rock to rest our bow on. Nowhere solid enough to disembark for repairs. We can't land. Harrow raised his voice to a growl. It echoed over the still water, the sound bouncing from sheer cliff walls. The rest of the crew tensed, clenching their fists and snarling in disappointment. Although the char's casual blasphemy sent a shudder down Kobaya's spine, he understood the captain's anger. Getting to Lion's Arch had been a treacherous journey. They had plenty of fish, but very little fresh water, and the havoc wouldn't survive if the waters turned rough. Moreover, now the char had no reason to keep Kobaya alive. He could feel them all around, for all with anger and disappointment looking for someone on whom to visit their wrath. We have to sail for Port Stalwart, Kobaya said quickly. Your plan still works, Centurion. If Lion's Arch is flooded, then Stalwart's overflowing as well. That means the storms deepened their bay enough for us to make harbor. The Havoc can sail into their bay. Kobaya tried to keep his voice steady. By now, he knew the Shar well enough to realize what they'd do if they heard weakness. The centurion's eyebrow lifted. He turned and fixed an unblinking stare on the human. A fair point, Mouse, Harrow conceded at last. But what if the waves destroyed Stalwart as well? A skeptical rumble thundered through the crew. Stalwart's on high ground. That's why their harbor's shallow. The town'll be there. The centurion still looked dubious, and Kobaya repeated firmly, It'll be there. With a bored noise, Macha yawned. What the human's not telling you, Centurion, is that the nations of Or and Crida were at war when Lion's Arch was built. That's why they put it behind the natural fortifications of those stone escarpments. Stalwart's newer, designed generations after the Orion Peninsula was destroyed. Despite its dowdy name, Port Stalwart is a vacation town, not a fortress. It's built to have an oh-so-pretty view. Macha tugged on her multicolored braids, tightening the leather strap that held the thick coil atop her skull. Unless the tide rose higher than one would surmise by looking at this soggy rubble, stalwart's fine. The human's right. When Kabaya and Psychox stared at her, the Asura tossed her head and had the gall to look annoyed. How did you know all that? Kobaya whispered. I never heard that story. Yes, well, Macha sniffed. Some of us can read, the char crew muttered, arguing back and forth as they chewed on the information, while their centurion considered. Kobaya looked him in the eye and tried not to let his nerves show. One of the char in the throng laughed darkly. The captain shot him a snarl. Psychox cleared his throat, and the centurion's glare focused on him. As I see it, sir, the only other choice is to scuttle the havoc and swim ashore. If we do that, we're committed to marching through Krita, over the Shiver Peaks, and all the way across Ascalon to get back to the Black Citadel. That's eight weeks' march, sir. Six, if we're lucky. Ten, if we have to fight our way through a host of Critan soldiers coming to see what happened to their capital city. The centurion didn't seem convinced, and Psychox added, Most importantly, we'd lose the prototype engine, and it'll take years to build again. The tribune said. I know what the tribune said. Displeased, the centurion clenched his clawed hands around the deck rail. The engine's our priority. I am aware of my orders, engineer. I don't need you to remind me. At the rebuke, Psychox stiffened to attention and stepped back. Centurion Harrow considered his options in silence. His eyes flicked over the broken masts sticking out of the water, 
the rough edges of the muddy sea, and the ruins of the city both above and below the tide. There were plenty of reasons to make sure. The strain of the voyage was beginning to tell on the soldiers, and the tides around Lion's Arch were difficult to navigate, especially so in the massive overflow of water from the giant wave. Kobaya tried to stay calm and let no indication of fear show on his face. We sail for stalwart, Centurion Harrow announced. Psychox, the engineers will need to shovel low to save on coal. We'll use wind power as best we can until the mastheads give way, and then we'll limp the last portion. Centurion. The boson in the high crow's nest blew his signal whistle imperiously, drawing attention to his cries. Sail ahoy. Sail, sir, yelled the watch. A ship to south, sir? All eyes turned toward the mouth of the ruined harbor. Indeed, there among the waterlogged tops of ravaged houses, between the trunks of shattered masts, sailed a narrow brigantine. She was smaller than the havoc, but quick in her turns, with two tall, square-sailed masts, festooned with mismatched canvas sails. To her fore, two long jib sails stretched to the end of a long bowsprit, and along her side, one word had been crudely painted, Disenmeedle. Kobaya could see that the six cannon ports along the Disenmeedle's starboard side were already open, the black noses of cannons nudging out from within. Along her upper deck, five small carronades perched over the deck railing. At the brigantine's quarter-deck, a massive garrison gun had been fixed, turned at any angle. It could destroy an enemy with a single shot. Kobaya stared at it in disbelief, recognizing the weapon. It was a bombard, one of the guns stationed on the wall surrounding Lion's Arch. Or it had been before the city was destroyed. The brigantine's crew must have prized it from its place on the stone and bolted it to their ship. That gun had the firepower to open a four-foot hole straight through the havoc and out the other side. What are their colors, Boson? said Centurion Harrow. They're not flying colors, sir. No flag at all. Kobaya frowned. If that ship was Creighton, they'd be flying the king's flag. I don't think they're a chartered ship not with their sails in that condition. Pirates, Harrow reached the same conclusion. Vultures taking advantage of the damage caused by the storm. Plenty of refuse here for them to pick through. Kobaya nodded, and the centurion continued. Doesn't matter if they're chartered or not, Mouse. They're human. We're char. Our ship is obviously wounded. They'll attack. The centurion shook his head knowingly furry mane settling about his shoulders. It's what I would do in their place. Indeed, the little ship tacked toward them, and Kobaya could hear echoes of the sailors on board. Turning away from them, the centurion started barking out orders to his men. Is the havoc armed? Kobaya grabbed Psychox's shoulder. Psychox sighed. Nah. We were just out to test the engines. We weren't on a combat mission. She set sail with barely anything to speak of. The engineer rubbed his cheek thoughtfully, his rusty whiskers sticking out at all angles between his claws. Fifteen carronades, six cannons, and four firemoles. Kobaya blinked. You call that unarmed? Psychox crossed his arms stubbornly. You do if you're a char. Seeing Kobaya's eyes light up, the engineer sighed. I said we sailed with that. I didn't say we still had it. The wave messed up the havoc right bad, and we had to dump the heavy load, or her keeled have given out long before now. Those cannons are at the bottom of the sea. All we have left are the fire moles. Seeing Kobaya's blank stare, Psychox explained, fire moles shoot balls of fire, not iron, so while they might set that brig alight, they won't do much to sink her. They're slow falling, too. The shot's made of goose dung and powder instead of weighted metal. The brig'll dance right out from under him. How many shots do we have? That's the other problem. Psychox fell silent. The wind swept through the char's fur in ripples, 
and Kobia could hear the human sailors on the other ship yelling as they loaded their guns. Can the Firemalls win this battle? No, Psychox sighed. Almost certainly not. Then we have to find something else. Kobaya found himself desperately wishing he had a pistol. A sword. Something, he snatched up a belaying pin, willing to chuck it at the brigantine. If there was any chance, it would help. We're done for, aren't we? Don't be so overdramatic, Mouse. This ship has all the weapons it needs. Macha narrowed her eyes. It has me. That's right. You're a mesmer. I forgot. Hey, does that mean you can blast them? The Shar asked eagerly, his four ears flicking forward with delight. Macha snorted. Don't be stupid. Can you make a big wind to push them away from us? Kobaya asked hopefully. Of course not. That's not how my spells work. Then what help are you? Psychox tugged at his horns in frustration. Macha tossed her head smugly. I'm smarter than they are. The first volley from the brigantine fell just short of the Havoc's bow, splashing huge gouts of water across the deck. The echo of guns roared like thunder over the ruined harbor, an ear-splitting bang coupled with the acrid smell of powder smoke. The Shar were already in their battle positions, but Kobaya was aware how pitifully few they were, and how poorly armed. If they'd been aboard the proud Indomitable, they would have had a chance. A many-gunned ship of the line against the quick brigantine might have been a good fight, but there was no way the Disenmato could bring down a well-prepared galleon. Against the havoc in her battered shape, Kobaya had little hope they would survive. The crew pulled out the fire moles, short-barreled guns that looked like crouching lions, their mouths opened wide and their claws clenched around stiff brass wheels. The char crew quickly loaded the guns with strange, sticky ammunition that looked for all the world like gooey balls of twine. Kobaya caught the scent of lamp oil and a strange, sickly sweet tang. The black-furred helmsman roared a command, and Havoc's fire mauls boomed in response. Four balls of flame exploded into the air. Long, fiery tails stretched out behind them, like comets, as they arched toward the Disson Needle, in long, languid curves. Drifting almost in slow motion, Kobaya could see what Psychox meant about the brigantine dancing out from under the fire mole's attack. The balls of flame fell far more slowly than cannonballs, and were easier to see, even during the day. As soon as their flight began to curve— and the pirates saw where the balls of flame would land. They let their sails swell and darted out from beneath the attack. Each of the four comets splashed into the water, unraveling in great, greasy splotches across the bay. Fire spread across each floating, oily mass, but no farther, making the patches easy to avoid. The wind swept smoke from the fire malls across the ship, clouds of it billowing in dark waves around Kobaya. He leaned out across the railing to keep clear of it. He could see the tide tugging on the oily patches, carrying some of the flame to ignite the thin masts of wreckage that thrust up from below like the skeletal bones of Malcor's fingers. The disenmatel darted between them and turned her port side toward the Havoc to launch another volley of heavy shot at the Havoc's hull. The ship rolled in the heavy surf as the centurion howled for a turn. Hard to lee, Fesher. Harrow's long tail cracked like a whip as he strode over the deck. The helmsman called his ascent and spun the wheel at the rear of the quarterdeck. In a breath, the ship tilted dangerously away from the gale. The rudder beneath the havoc's stern shifted to the side, and wind leached out of the high sails. Psychox spun on his heel and raced toward the stairs that led below. The engine— he declared. I've got to keep her fired, or we'll stall. We need to head against the wind, or they'll catch. The last words were lost beneath the increasing whistle of more incoming shot. The sheets and braces of the Havoc's sails creaked against the mast as they tried to catch the wind once more. Macha and Kobaya grabbed the railing as the Havoc tilted, 
and were rewarded by huge guffs of water exploding from the sea below, as the Disson Meadle's cannonballs landed only a few feet short of the char ship's wooden side. One more like that, and they'll cave us in. The helmsman roared, his sharp teeth glinting. Ram them, Kobaya screamed, stumbling to his feet. He lurched toward the centurion and grabbed the char's arm, not caring for his own safety. Sir, head toward them. Not away. What in the mists are you rambling about, Mouse? bellowed the centurion. Are you mad? They're guns. I know how those carronades work, sir. We have just a few minutes while they water down the guns and reload. If we charge them now, we can board them. Board them? The helmsman choked. Their crews three times the size of ours. Yeah. Kobaya gave him a thin smile. But if I remember the stories right, and if your engineer's bragging has any substance, a char's worth four humans in hand-to-hand -hand combat. You don't have guns, Kobaya gasped. But you do have claws. The centurion paused, whiskers twitching. It's a trick. You're trying to get us closer to that ship so you can bolt and join your kind. Grenth, take me if I do. Kobaya pointed at the other ship with his belaying pin. One more man on their side wouldn't make any difference either way. There's no time, Captain. Point us at the disenmatel and argue with me after. The old char rubbed his white-furred chin. We could catch them, he finally agreed reluctantly. They're with the wind, and we have the use of our engine, something they won't expect. We can catch them. Convinced, the centurion nodded sharply and turned to roar at his crew. Turn the ship cross the wind, full bore the engine, and run them down. A cheer went up from the sailors. Aye, sir. Grist. The gray-furred old char saluted. I'll set her bow for the rush. With a groan of wood and creak of sail, the havoc turned back toward its enemy. Kobaya watched the humans labor desperately aboard the disenmetal. Wadding, shot, and gunpowder were being tossed back and forth as the crew hurried to ready their guns once more. Prepare to board the enemy, Centurion Harrow snarled. He turned on Kobaya with a fierce red glint in his eyes. You'll be at the fore, Mouse. And if you waver, you'll die by my claws before you can draw a breath. He strode away, ordering the other char into boarding positions. Kobaya leapt to the deck railing, trying to gauge whether they would draw alongside the disenmatel before her guns were ready to fire again. Every second was an agony. What's your plan, human? said a quiet voice at his elbow. Are you really going to help the Shar against your own people? Kobaya glanced down at Macha. Not you, too. Humans and Shar have been at war for generations. They've done you a service saving your life. But it's been forced labor since you set foot aboard the Havoc. He shook his head. Even if I was the kind to do such a thing, that brigantine over there is probably filled with valuables picked from the bones of the city I called home. It's crewed by scavengers. It attacked us, unprovoked, because they saw that we were wounded and looking for aid. So, Macha's wide mouth tilted into a skeptical smile. When the wave came, it took the indomitable. It took Lion's Arch. It took everything I had left, after, his voice broke, thinking of blue eyes and bouncing yellow curls. Gritting his teeth, he reached down and put his hand around the rag doll at his belt. I don't have a home, or a job, or a family. All I have is a ship. This ship. Kobaya set his feet against the motion of the havoc tossing in the waves. This crew's been good to me, whatever their reasons. That one's picking clean the bones of everything I ever loved. Whom? The Asura nodded curtly. She looked out to sea the stiff wind tossing her multicolored braids about her shoulders. So when we reach the disenmatel, your plan's basically gah. Jedum, you expect to survive that? Always worked for me before. Kobaya leaned forward on the rail, trying not to focus on the past. You have a better idea? As a matter of fact, I do. Macha grinned, showing a smile made of sharp little teeth. 
head for the battery gun at the back of their ship. Whatever else happens, no matter what you have to do, get to that gun. She gestured toward the brig's quarterdeck with both hands, as if she were unfurling a flag. Get over there and gaw get em in that direction. And then what? Macha stared at him as if his head were filled with feathers. Fire the gun, idiot. Fire the... Kabaya choked. Are you kidding me? Use your anemic human eyes and look at their ship, Mouse. They've bolted a bombard to their deck. That thing's not meant to be fixed to a hull. It's meant to be attached to a massive hunk of stone. And there's a reason for that. Even your simplistic human mind should be able to understand that it's a matter of applied force. Macha leaned closer and broke her sentence into small words. They've never fired that gun. If they do, it'll twist their keel and the disenmetal will flounder in the water like a chicken off a cliff. Kobaya considered this. They've probably reinforced the main deck, or set a brace from the mast step. Macha snorted. We're talking about pirates, not mathematicians. Unless they have an Asura aboard, I doubt they've thought beyond. Oh, cool. A really big cannon. She swatted at him chastisingly. Just get on that ship and fire the bombard. Preferably not at us and then get back here before that mad cat Psychox runs out of coal and throws me into the furnace. She snorted and then winked up at him. Fire the gun, Kobaya. Physics will do the rest.